Hi there and welcome. Welcome everyone. Welcome to Alta Live. This is the video streaming show we do here at the Journal of Alta California. I am so excited to welcome today's guests, Pete Galindo, Director of the Social and Public Art Resource Center's Great Wall of Los Angeles Institute, along with Alta Journal Associate Editor and my fabulous colleague, AJ Arona. Today, we're going to break down Los Angeles neighborhood Boyle Heights murals past, present, and future, look at two iconic neighborhood pieces and talk about what marketed murals, corporations are now kind of co-opting LA's incredible mural history for advertising purposes. So what does this mean for LA's storied history of stunning street heart? Before we get started, some brief housekeeping. Again, Alta Live is the digital event series we do here at Alta Journal. My name is Beth Spotswood. I'm Alta's digital editor. And if you're unfamiliar with us um, and you're into street art, you're, you're in for a lucky um, issue. This is our art special issue. So please do check it out. You can find out more about Alta at altaonline.com. We are an award-winning quarterly magazine focused on California and the West. And we like to explore um, extraordinary topics like the one we're gonna talk about today. Again, street art going corporate. There's a question and answer button at the bottom of the street screen. Please do ask any questions you have for Peter AJ. We will chat for about 30 minutes and then get to as many of your questions as we can. This event will be recorded, posted to altaonline.com later today. And we're also gonna shoot you an email with a link to this video. To kick it off, please let us know where you're zooming in from in the comments. It's always fun to see where our crowd is um, zooming in from. So I'm here in Novato, California. Um, Pete and AJ down in SoCal, where are you two zooming in from today? Well, I'm, I'm in Venice uh, at the Social and Public Art Resource Center. I'm in the beautiful city of Claremont, California. The glitz, the glam of SoCal. Mm -hmm. um, welcome. Thank you both so much for taking the time to do this today. Pete, I wanted to start with you. You are our kind of street art historian expert. Can you tell us a little bit about street art in LA, particularly certain neighborhoods? I know certain neighborhoods in LA are known for their street art, namely Boyle Heights. Um, and what is so special about the LA's, the LA area's connection to street art that's different from any other city in the world? Well, um, I can speak specifically to murals in, in Los Angeles and in particular Boyle Heights. And I'm gonna make a bit of a distinction between um, graph art and, and murals as, as kind of sanctioned work and graph art, which is largely unsanctioned. Um, but they, they do have overlapping histories and they do have overlapping traditions. Uh, murals in Los Angeles and in Boyle Heights in particular uh, come from a legacy and tradition of resistance and as an alternative form of media for um, the Chicano and Chicana movement, but also the larger civil rights movement uh, throughout the country. And in, and in Los Angeles in particular, it became an effective tool for uh, young Chicano and Chicanas prior to uh, the advent of social media. And, and of course, when there was a real limit with regard to media that folks had access to. So the murals were, were at one, they were on one hand fine art, uh, and on the other hand, they were alternative media um, and advocacy. Can you talk a little bit about the distinction, if there even is one, between graffiti and street art or murals? Well, you know, the, the early murals in Los Angeles were um, kind of an extension of graffiti. And, and of course, graffiti has had its own history of, of transformation. At the time that uh, Chicano murals were being painted, I mean, it was... Um, you know, kind of an extension of neighborhood graffiti, which was somet sometimes related to gangs, but also it wasn't necessarily related to gangs. Graffiti um, was a way for people to express their ideas and what was happening on the walls. And so people had their own kind of um, script that they would use. You look at someone like Chaz Bohorquez, for example, who's very well known for his script and his work. And, and it became, and each neighborhood has it, had its own script and its own narrative. But the, in terms of murals, a lot of artists from East Los Angeles saw the graffiti in their neighborhoods as an opportunity to say something larger, 
to rearticulate the graffiti. So a lot of early murals actually integrated neighborhood graffiti into the work. So for example, Willie Heron, who painted the wall that cracked open um, in response to his um, brother's, uh, a very violent attack on his brother, um, he integrated the pre-existing graffiti as a way to call the community to nonviolent nonviolence and to kind of frame the graffiti in relationship to the violence that was inflicted on his brother. So that reframing, that rearticulation, that conversation that was happening between graffiti artists and mural painters was real. It wasn't one was supplanting the other, but the idea was to actually be in conversation, unfold that conversation a little bit further and then present it back to the community for transformation. And for those of us who aren't in LA, Boyle Heights is a neighborhood that has really allowed that tradition um, and that form of kind of giving form to feeling to thrive over the past decade, a few decades. That's right, that's right. And, and uh, I mean, like every neighborhood in Los Angeles, Boyle Heights has been subject to increasing housing prices. People who can normally afford to live in the neighborhood are being pushed out by development. And there is a very active gentrification that's occurring in the neighborhood. And I think one of the things that we're gonna probably talk about today is how that gentrification is manifesting itself with regard to murals um, on the walls and that the walls themselves and the spaces themselves where murals can be produced are being gentrified. Well, that brings us to AJ. So AJ, you um, did a Q&A with Pete that is currently up on altaonline.com, but you're working on a larger story for the magazine. Can you tell us how does DoorDash, there's this beautiful history of community art in Boyle Heights, why on earth does a food delivery service app um, come into this conversation? Yeah, that was my question. So I actually was looking at some art in Northern California, some murals and kind of like this, looking into the street art community there when I reached out to Pete about uh, just art in, in Los Angeles. And if there was anything equivalent happening in the LA area that was happening in San Francisco. And, you know, I saw these, these DoorDash murals well, here, let me start off by saying, you don't know that they're DoorDash murals. You look at them and they look at first very much like they come from the community. They have that grassroots kind of look. Um, but probably the thing that's most peculiar is the name of the project that DoorDash gave to these murals. They're called Somos Boyle Heights, which is Spanish for we are Boyle Heights. These three murals are now throughout the neighborhood, small neighborhood, Hispanic neighborhood in Los Angeles. Um, Kind of celebrating the people, the 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 food, the culture of um, just Hisp you know Hispanics and Boyle Heights, and I'm wondering, you know, why why did DoorDash uh, sponsor this? Why did DoorDash target this small community um, and, and choose to, in a way, advertise here? But it just was a very, I thought, a very strange way of advertising. There's no product. There's no DoorDash product on there. There's a QR code, which I'm sure we can circle back to later. I'm sure Pete would like to talk about that. But um, you know, when I when I was a kid, I, I saw corporate street art. And in Hollywood, I remember there was this this uh, painting of a Sprite bottle. And whenever I'd pass it, I wanted Sprite. But you know, it was it's very effective because when you see the street art, it doesn't register as as an ad. It doesn't. I don't think it registers mentally as marketing. You see it, and you know, if you've known street artists or you've just seen street art, it just it seems grassroots. It seems very much like it's coming from the community. So DoorDash doing this, um, I think what they're, they're trying to get the jump on really uh, a new form and a clever form of advertising that kind of speaks directly to a community. Um, but again, that raised a whole bunch of questions that um, yeah, Pete and I have talked about. I'm sure Pete would like to address right now. Uh, Pete actually, he lives in Boyle Heights and he's, he's the one who told me about the murals at first. Well, they were, they were a, not, a, not a shock because I've seen this, this type of activity before. Um, but I mean, I, I'm conflicted, right? Because they, these murals and these advertisements do have a veneer of authenticity when you look at them. The people who are there aren't necessarily pop, you know, known within pop culture as um, Latinx icons, right? There are folks who are very um, rooted in the community of Boyle Heights and very well known and do really good work in Boyle Heights. You have people like Rafael Cárdenas who, is a photographer and artist who's also, I consider a good friend. And there's uh, 
you know, uh, Josefina Lopez, who wrote Real Women Have Curves and founded Casa Cero No Cero Uno. You have um, Christopher Escojeda, who goes by N.K. Riot, who's a local musician, and the list goes on and on and on. And it, there, it's a great little campaign, which has a really nice video and film attached to it, which has uh, kind of talks about people's impressions of Boyle Heights, particularly these folks who I consider leaders in the community and, and who DoorDash rightfully um, identified as leaders. But that it is a veneer of authenticity because what happens is while each of these people does really in-depth work in the neighborhood that seeks to change the neighborhood and pointing people in their direction is amazing. And, and thank you DoorDash for doing that. But at the same time, what we see is that there's been a kind of negligence by, the, by DoorDash, the company, to identify um, the organizations and the folks who have been working in mural painting for a very long time and have established that tradition. So you have an organization like Self Help Graphics and for all intents and purposes, I don't see them um, really associated with that. For example, there's an organization like Spark, which was involved. They're not associated with the project. And while I'm really happy that the artists who were commissioned to paint those murals who are local artists who, um, you know, I'm sure struggle every day to find um, ways in which to make a living doing the work that they're meant to do. The question then becomes, who's essentially dealing with those walls? Who's navigating that space? Who's negotiating that space uh, between the corporation and the community? And if the corporation is working directly with these landlords, now they're getting DoorDash money. They're not getting self-help graphics money. And now when a, a mural wants to be uh, produced, they're gonna, they're gonna have, they're gonna expect that DoorDash money, which we, mm. we don't know what that is, right? Have and you also, communicated at all with DoorDash? Just out of curiosity? I haven't, I haven't. Would uh, you be willing to call them up and just be like, hey, it's Pete I, 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 Absolutely. What's your I'm, deal? Absolutely, but I think the, the bigger question is this, is what is ultimately the goal of these murals? Right. And so, for example, whenever Spark works on a mural, and I'll give it the example of the Central American Resource Center, we produced the first mural about Central American migration into the US. Telling that story was a way to heal many, many years of trauma and a way for young people to enter into that history, um, claim that history, and figure out where their place is in it in the future. And we had many students who participated in that mural who went on and did some really incredible things. Um, and it was a two-year project and, and there, the, the mural is there in Gaddison and has been there for you know, more than 15 years. The DoorDash uh, project is really to point people toward DoorDash ultimately, right? And as an organization that is involved with the delivery of food to a community, I think larger questions can be asked about what kind of food do people in Boyle Heights have access to, right? What's the level of health uh, in that community? What food is actually being delivered? So all of these things are, are questions that would be asked in a normal mural project, but that this mural project doesn't ask, right? They kind of paint, they paint Boyle Heights as this isolated utopia in the middle of Los Angeles that has its own identity, which to some extent is true. But at the other, on, uh, on the other hand, there are major needs in that neighborhood. And those needs aren't really called into question in any of the work. Right. Can you share some imagery with us? Are you ready to share sure. a screen? Um, Take us on a journey. I, I mean, we could, let's see, so. I mean, I'd like to see did, some, some of the, the original murals that you were talking about that were. Well, you know, I grew up in, in a neighborhood um, called Ramona Gardens Housing Project, which is in Boyle Heights. It has one of the largest concentrations of, of murals anywhere in Los Angeles. And um, I can show a couple of those and what that neighborhood looks like. Um, are you seeing my screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay. This is this is 
for example, um, a mural by Manuel Cruz uh, called To Ace Out a Homeboy. This was painted in 1973. Um, it's, it's a great work, but as you see, like these pieces exist in the midst of this public housing project, right? This is a, a mural painted with Judith Hernandez with some assistance from Carlos Almaraz. And um, this one's called La Mujer. It's a beautiful piece that was recently restored. Um, this is Ghost of the Barrio by Wayne Healy, who's a member of the East Los Streetscapers. And so you mm. see that these, these pieces here, um, you know, aren't advertising anything other than culture. I mean, they're really kind of calling into question, you know, who we are, where we come from. And of course, some of the narratives are a little bit dated. Some of the narratives are um, rooted in, in the movement of the 1970s, but there was an evolution of murals. But the same ideas took place and people from the neighborhoods worked on these murals. People were engaged in their production and they were part of other initiatives and other parts of the movement. So the, the, this is kind of, this is where I grew up and this is what I was influenced by. Um, but you also have other things like uh, Judy Baca who painted some of the first murals in Los Angeles went on to do the Great Wall of, uh, of LA which is a half mile long mural. And Yeah, can so you tell us about the Great Wall of LA? Sure, sure. And, and right here we're looking at one one 350 foot segment, right? Um, sorry, uh, let me go back to that. And, and so this piece here um, was painted over 10 years and this segment was painted over one summer. And so it was painted in collaboration with over 400 young people. And the idea here was to paint a piece that, what, that whose central metaphor was a tattoo on the scar where the river once ran. And that river was the LA River and the scar was the concreting. The violation was actually destroying the ecosystem that exists there. And so what do you tattoo on that scar uh, to, to kind of transform the meaning of, of what you're seeing of that assault of, of, of that gash through the land? You tattoo the invisible histories of the people who inhabit that city people of color who've been ignored. And when this began in 1976, those histories were just being written, were just being explored. In particular, those histories that revolved around um, ideas of social justice. There's Dr. Charles Drew who invented blood plasma, right? This is a fight to end discrimination in housing in Los Angeles. Um, here are the Zoot Suit Riots, 1943. This is Luisa Moreno who advocated for uh, agricultural workers. Here's the St. Louis that was sent back in World War II with Jewish refugees to Germany, most of whom were um, put into concentration camps. And of course, this is the um, baby boom, right? And then in the window, you see GIs who were promised um, access to housing and education and were denied that because those resources were of course limited and they were limited to mostly Anglo soldiers. I mean, there were tent cities in Griffith Park of families whose, whose um, fathers went and fought in the war. And when they came back, the only housing available to them was a tent and a school in mud um, at Griffith Park. So this is one of the first murals to really talk about those histories. And it wasn't you know, painted without collaboration, I mean, you had several young people who worked on it, most of which had been arrested at least once. They came back summer after summer to work on this piece. And many of their lives were impacted by their participation in this piece. The work wasn't just about learning how to paint on the wall because many of them were, were not artists. Many of them were untrained, but it was also about learning how to get along with each other, working across difference, figuring out not only how to deal with the issues of painting inside of that environment, but also painting an environment that included people that were different from them, having to navigate that space, and also having to process this history that was not only their own, but someone else's, and learning empathy through engaging in those histories. And of course, here's Judy Baca with one of her, one of her teams, the 
um, team from the uh, that that exact summer that we were looking at, right? This was every summer for eight years. And so what we're doing right now with the Great Wall Institute, the Great Wall of Los Angeles ends in the 1950s. We're actually gonna continue that mural from the 1960s to the present. We're establishing what's called an institute at the site, which is near Valley College. And we're gonna integrate the design of that mural with their social justice programs, work with young people in continuation high schools, give them, not only pay them to participate, but also, um, support dual enrollment so that they're also getting college credit and they're able to begin reimagining a future for themselves working in the arts and creating a certificate program. And these are all things that we're exploring, we're looking at, we're, we're doing because we don't think that it ends with the artwork. The image is great as, as a memorial to not only the histories that we're discussing, but the process of making that work. But in terms of building infrastructure, addressing social issues, um, we need to address what we're representing on the wall and find a, a, a very concrete way to deal with that and to change that. It seems like the history of the murals, particularly the Great Wall of Los Angeles and the, the um, almost exhaustive work and thought and consideration and discussion that's got into it, um, and the generational trauma that the neighborhood and it's it's the community has felt is the the murals on the wall are a sacred space in in some ways. And so, is there a sense of violation that a corporation like DoorDash is coming in and kind of using the language? And I mean, I guess I can start with you, AJ, because you're the one who's um, pitched this story. It was an exciting day at Alta when AJ was like, "I got this idea." Um, but is there is it? kind of a, a breach of trust perhaps or some uh, the, short answer, the short answer is that it's complicated yeah it, it's very complicated and you know, I spoke to uh people in the community including Pete and I, you know other business owners residents high school students um I even spoke to the artists who were hired they were conflicted as well because as Pete um mentioned earlier here they are putting their their talents to work, they are getting the artists are getting paid. The artists are even putting images, you know, that that's that's from, you know, for, from from their imaginations on this. But it's all through kind of the constraints of DoorDash. And uh, to kind of give an example of how it's complicated, I was speaking to one of the artists who painted one of my favorite murals. It's the one of uh, a woman. She's kind of her hands are coming down, kind of from the sky, and she's rolling a bowl of masa for food. And there's or this corn and limes um, throughout the mural. It's, it's striking, it's very beautiful. But uh, the, the artist told me that, you know, at several points, DoorDash told them, you can't have this color or change the limes to yellow or do this, you can't have this. He wanted to have the woman's face in the mural. They said, no face. That's why you have the arms coming up so high up from the sky. Uh, so these, these, it left the artist very, they didn't actually know how to feel about it. Because it, this is it, actually, think, this is the art that you're referring to that we used in the exactly that's the art description for this. Yeah, so this is the door. This is an example of kind of the DoorDash um, mural art. You'll note that it's in Spanish. What what happens if you click on the QR code? Where do you go? So you go to a video that DoorDash created, and this is the only time that you'll see the DoorDash logo anywhere throughout this whole project, throughout the murals, throughout anything takes you to a video that they made about a lot of the people, the artists and people in the community that Pete mentioned earlier, leaders, artists, teachers, educators, um, uh, all kinds of people from different you know, walks of life. They're all leaders in the community. They're all, all very involved and everybody knows them. So they kind of, they talk about Boyle Heights, what Boyle Heights means to them. It's a very well-made polished video, but at the end there's DoorDash's, yes, yeah, made by DoorDash. You know? <laughs> and at the end you have DoorDash's logo and it just feels weird. You know, you're, you're like, why you know what why 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 is DoorDash doing this and um the people in the community were conflicted i spoke to some they said who cares it's awesome others said yeah but there's a catch there has to be a catch and um some are even assaulted that they said somos spoil heights like not all of us speak spanish some of us don't speak spanish there's a history of russians italians um and japanese in the area lots of different communities so they said if they're telling the story about heights why aren't they, why aren't they represented? So it's just, it felt very much mostly to, to 
uh, a lot of the people in the neighborhood that DoorDash may have good intentions, but even if they did, it's still strange. Pete? Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, the, the, um, I, it's complicated exactly as, as AJ says, but what's not, what's not complicated about it is that, is that clearly the motive is, is DoorDash in, are, are they, you know, the question is, are they really committed to this relationship, hmm. right? And what does commitment really mean? Commitment means that you're present, that you're looking to make the situation better. And I, I really do think that, well, there's all of, it, it's, it, this presentation of community front and center provides DoorDash a kind of shield, mm -hmm. right? So we can't say anything too negative about the campaign because the friends and people we respect are, are so prominently featured in this piece. But the larger questions aren't really being asked because what's being said is very easy to agree. It's agreeable, right? We, of course, the, Boyle Heights has its own community that's made up of these folks who really love being there and have a lot of pride in their neighborhood. Of course, we're gonna, we're gonna all say yes to that. But the tougher question is really, well, what makes Boyle Heights unique but what also makes Boyle Heights neglected? And, and why do we have such a large concentration of fast food restaurants in Boyle Heights? And I know if we started to make, have, ask those questions, I don't know that DoorDash would be so um, gung-ho about putting that on a mural, right? And asking about why there's a, you know, a shorter lifespan for people who live in Boyle Heights that's directly related to their food options. That's directly related to the companies that DoorDash relies on for their business model. We can't undo that and we can't question that. And so when we talk about DoorDash and what their responsibility is, it's very intense. There's a lot of responsibility there, but none of it is really being dealt with or talked about. And so that's why I think that it's not a very committed relationship. Interesting. What um, Lauren asks, if DoorDash was more transparent about wanting to partner with the community to create art that represents the community, I mean, even if it's a, if it's a statement about the food desert that exists in Boyle Heights, would that have made a difference in the community's ownership of them? I don't know. I, uh, frankly, I don't know. And, and it's one example of how this conversation could actually go and develop. But I think we also have to talk about the economics of it, right? Why is DoorDash taking on work that, for example, a nonprofit like Self Help Graphics would uh, most likely do in that neighborhood, right? Self Help Graphics is three blocks away from where the Somos Boyle Heights mural is at the top of Boyle and, and, and First Street. They're perfectly capacitated to actually oversee something like that and engage in those conversations. They've been around for 50 years, but that money didn't go to self-help graphics. Could, um, Dan asks, could the whole DoorDash mural concept just be part of the gentrification of Boyle Heights? Is this just, can you talk a little bit about just gentrification in Boyle Heights? And is this uh, a symptom of that? I'll let you take this one again, Pete. Okay, great. No, absolutely, absolutely. And it's like I said, those walls are, are almost being, they're, they're being gentrified because now the conversation isn't about a donation of a space or um, sharing a space so that something important could be said about a community. So a, a business can invest back into its community by getting, providing space for there to be an interesting conversation the what ends up happening is that the um now they want they want to deal with doordash and those murals are forever going to be doordash walls i mean is doordash going to give up that wall for something else to be said i hope right so. but well the someone question, asks that actually you know what if doordash just and this what if doordash just donated money to self-help graphics to do murals with no strings attached um that would be, that would be much better actually yeah. Because, because these are organizations that have built the model, right? 
all of those all of those artists that you saw, for example, and 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 cultural workers and people in featured have been supported by nonprofit arts organizations, and and have found space and support there, and have developed as a result of their existence. They didn't, and and of course, um, those organizations, the kind of infrastructure that already exists in a place like Boyle Heights, is completely ignored. Right, so you're talking about like independent businesses, which are great, which I, I love. I love Meatbug Grill. I eat there. It's great food. It's one of the answers to the food desert in Boyle Heights. And thank you, DoorDash, for featuring Meatbug Grill. What's the name oh, of it again? Say it Meatbug clearly. Meatbug Grill, M I L P A Grill. Right. right. Run, own, own and run by a woman who's who's um, featured in in the piece. And I'll say Meatbug Grill one more time, just in case. <laughs> Let's <laughs> plug it. I, but but the but the um, but again, does does DoorDash make the majority of their money on on meat by grill? Is that is that the goal? And the infrastructure that's been built already exists to support artists and support the production of art um, around uh, Boyle Heights. And I think that DoorDash would have done a greater service to the community had they secured the walls and said, "We're going to dedicate these walls to a conversation about food in this community." And then that conversation would not have been nice or comfortable or even um, profitable, but it would have been a, a very real conversation. Right. Wow. Um, we are we are out of time, but I do want to give before before I thank everyone, Pete. If people want to um, visit the Great Wall of LA, we have a lot of interest in kind of going to to check out some of these murals, but namely the Great Wall. Where should they go? Well, they should they should go to um, if you look it up on Google Maps, it shows up. It's uh, located on Coldwater Canyon between Burbank Boulevard and Oxnard in North Hollywood. Someone did post the address, the official address. But what happens is it takes you to um, the, the end of the Great Wall. And really, the Great Wall begins at the cold at the corner of Coldwater and Burbank. And it, it begins in prehistoric Los Angeles, actually. And the, the, the importance of that is actually that we talk about uh, native people who lived, indigenous people who lived in Los Angeles and in California, because one of the myths, of course, of California is that when the Spanish arrived, no one was really here. There were people here and there, but kind of not really. And in, in fact, what we know is that California was one of the most densely populated uh, places in the Americas and uh, by indigenous people. And, and there was a huge um, amount of death that occurred once colonization began. And of course there are, we have one of the largest populations of native Americans and reservations in Southern California and that's not acknowledged as well. So, I mean, I think that, that that's where the great wall begins. And then it just goes from there to the 1950s. And so it's a nice half mile long walk uh, right now, we're building a pedestrian bridge. Uh, we're building a few interpretive stations that are going to have QR codes. And uh, <laughs> the so infamous those, QR codes. Those, those QR codes will point us to virtual exhibitions though, that will change, um, that will uh, the the thematically will reference some of the historical moments in the piece. And the Great Wall will be lit at night. And then we'll, of course, we're in the process of beginning to put together the, the design team for the next six decades. And the mural is going to wrap around. So instead of just going down further down the wash, it's actually going to wrap around another half mile. So you'll kind of walk around the entire piece. Wow. This is awesome. What I mean, it, it really, it's such an example of positivity um, and kind of continuing the conversation through this incredible mural, which I will be checking out on my next visit to LA. Pete Galindo, thank you so much for joining us. AJ, thank you for bringing this to our attention and to Alta's attention. Um, AJ is gonna continue to write about this issue for Alta and speak with Pete. So um, please keep an eye out for that in a future issue of Alta Journal. And before you go, a quick plug for us, um, next week, we will welcome Hillary Fitzgerald Campbell, a cartoonist and author of the new graphic novel, Murder Book. So true crime fans, um, please join me for that. That's Wednesday, November 10th at 1230 right here at Alta Online. Um, again, Pete and AJ, I am so very grateful to both of you for joining me today and um, sharing this wisdom and information with us. It's been really eye-opening. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, AJ. Thank you, Beth.
Thanks, Pete. Take care, everyone.